Have you ever sympathized with a monster? I remember as a child seeing images depicting the legend of St. George slaying a dragon, but I didn't have the reaction to these pictures I was supposed to. The dragons didn't look evil, they looked sad. And the older I've become, the more media I've seen where monsters suffer, the less monstrous they seem. To empathize with a monster is to go against thousands of years of storytelling precedent. The traditional mythic role of a monster is to be a kind of living obstacle, typically one that embodies dominant fears in its culture of origin. The very word monster comes from the Latin monere, meaning to warn. When a courageous hero vanquishes a monster, it's not supposed to be tragic, but a victory over a societal anxiety. This conventional model of monsterhood is the one most of us are familiar with. Next to pottery, maybe? Monsters are about as close to a cultural universal as you can get. Wherever there are people telling stories, there are stories of monsters. But what is considered monstrous and worthy of scorn or fear varies across cultures and time. So what one civilization judges to be irredeemable, another might pity and empathize with. It all comes down to perspective. Like, there's that one scene in Star Wars where our hero crushes a monster called a Rancor with a gate, which feels triumphant, until you see this one side character look so heartbroken, like this creature meant the world to him. And though the Rancor didn't seem like the nicest fellow, as a child this moment made me wonder if the creature was truly evil, or just a starving animal in a pit. Sympathizing with a monster isn't a novel concept, but it is one that's evolved over the years. One of the most important turning points in film came in the early 20th century, when Universal Pictures thrust the tragic monster into the Hollywood zeitgeist with the success of 1931's Frankenstein. Based on Mary Shelley's 19th century novel about scientist Victor Frankenstein who reanimates a creature made from corpses, the film makes numerous changes from the source material, yet keeps the core tragedy of the central, unwanted creation. Upon awakening, Frankenstein's monster is essentially an innocent newborn, but because of his monstrous strength and appearance, he's abandoned and mistreated by those around him, including his own creator. It is through this mistreatment that the monster learns to act monstrous, lashing out with anger at a world that has given him anger in turn. And the film emphasizes that the creature does have the capacity for kindness if met with kindness, even if just for a fleeting moment. Though he cannot help being inhuman in the eyes of others, his nature is not inherently inhumane. Where the novel and the film differ is that in the movie, the creature remains infantile until the end, whereas in the book he becomes eloquent and cunning, committing inhumane acts with full awareness to punish his creator. Yet the novel, too, indicates that the creature's cruelty stems from its initial abandonment, and the horror that follows is ultimately the fault of Dr. Frankenstein's hubris. The very idea for the creature came from Mary Shelley's apprehension towards people attempting to use electricity to revive corpses. So while Frankenstein's monster embodies fears of human recklessness, he is also, innately, a victim of that same recklessness. There's the old gotcha that Frankenstein isn't the name of the monster, but the name of the man. But from a thematic perspective, it's not that clear cut. Yet Frankenstein wasn't the only 19th century monster novel turned blockbuster to come out in 1931. Universal's Dracula was an even bigger hit, sticking more closely to a folkloric model of monsterhood, with a largely unsympathetic monster threatening the sanctity of a social good. This Dracula can be seen as a manifestation of US post-war anxieties over perceived external dangers coming from afar to threaten the home, as can many of the universal creature features that followed. Yet a surprising number of these films also find pathos in their monsters, with the writers aware, at least on some level, of the tragedy inherent in being rejected by society for something you can't control. So maybe it's no surprise that many of these monsters have been reimagined over the years as more sympathetic and non-threatening figures. Asking audiences to empathize with, say, a vampire is far from unheard of these days. It opened its wings like this, screeching. Ah! 
Now you are vampire. And it was Peter. And we're still friends today. The surprisingly sympathetic framing of Universal's early monsters can in many ways be traced back to the 1928 silent film The Man Who Laughs. The story of a circus performer mutilated as a child into having a permanent grin, the central figure of The Man Who Laughs is neither a supernatural creature nor in any way villainous. He is only a monster from the perspective of a public that will not accept him. Though likely the inspiration for the iconic villain the Joker, the original Man Who Laughs never snaps and becomes the monster everyone expects him to be. In fact, he gets a happy ending despite his appearance never changing. For a movie from the 1920s, the film is surprisingly nuanced in its exploration of the lead character's lived experience. At the time of release, The Man Who Laughs was lumped in with figures like The Hunchback of Notre Dame by marketers under the umbrella of Universal Monsters, which speaks to a callous public perception of people that were physically non-normative. This tragically echoes the history of many so-called monsters in folklore, with werewolf legends, for example, likely related to individuals with hypertrichosis, a condition that causes hair growth throughout the body. Fear of the unknown or of that which a societal majority deems abnormal is at the heart of a lot of monster myths, with the label of monster used to demonize and dehumanize those perceived as other. In European history, fear of the unknown also manifested in the form of geographic monsters, the kinds of beasts that populate the edges of medieval and renaissance maps, meant to evoke the perceived dangers of far-off locations. Over the centuries, tall tales of fantastical beings from distant lands and distorted accounts of actual wildlife combined with growing imperialism into a worldview that linked monsters with regions unmapped by Europeans. By the early 20th century, this worldview merged with paleontological discoveries to create lost world narratives, wherein adventurers would discover not mythic monsters but lost prehistoric life, which they then conquered in a manner that reflected imperialist attitudes towards nature and indigenous populations. And out of this muddled mythos emerged King Kong, one of the most enduring pop culture figures of the last century with a complex place in the realm of sympathetic monsterdom. Coming two years after Universal's monsters broke onto the scene, the original King Kong is a movie of contrasts. On the one hand, the titular Kong feels like the geographic monster personified, presented as a treacherous embodiment of the unknown that the intrepid explorers must subjugate. On the other hand, unlike most Universal monsters, Kong is, at least initially, not the invading figure, but the one attacked in his own home. And the film does seem aware of and sympathetic to this unfairness on some level. Not just an obstacle, Kong is given moments that could be classified as heroic, which later reboots have made more explicitly valiant. Though Kong eventually rampages through New York, this only occurs after he is forcibly removed from his original environment. In here the film's sympathies split once again, as Kong's eventual fate at the hands of the military is presented as both tragic and the preordained outcome of nature clashing with industrial society. Peter Jackson's reboot in particular brings this tragedy more to the surface. But in that film, Kong's defeat upon challenging humanity still seems inescapable. Which is why it's notable that the latest incarnation of Kong flips this dynamic on its head. In that series, Kong is closer to a deity, a symbolic reminder of how insignificant humanity is compared to the endurance of the natural world. This is also the most overtly noble version of Kong ever put to film, presented as an honorable defender of the ecosystem. The original movie might pity Kong to an extent, but the latest incarnation is explicitly, textually on the side of Kong and not the humans pillaging his home. He is always the invaded, never the invader. And I think this transformation means more than critics give it credit for. The fact that Kong has gone from semi-antagonist to essentially an action hero suggests that the attitude of general audiences towards monsters has changed over the last century. Speaking of which, isn't there another iconic giant monster who's gone from villain to hero over the decades? Godzilla rose up from the depths in the early 50s, 
Ushering in a new wave of atomic age monsters, anxiety over the seemingly limitless potential of nuclear power led to a slew of films where unfeeling mutants terrorized humanity for their folly. Though many were the creation of Hollywood, Godzilla was a uniquely Japanese depiction of post-nuclear trauma, with the first film a somber analog for atomic devastation. But the more Godzilla films came out, the more the tone, uh, shifted a bit, with the movies becoming increasingly silly. No longer a dead serious embodiment of post-war suffering, Godzilla became something of a national mascot. A figure who, though occasionally still destructive, was typically contrasted against a more overtly villainous monster. This change was in response to Japanese audiences sympathizing with the character and wanting to see him as the protagonist, despite his monstrous form. The director of the original Godzilla, Ishihiro Honda, has a poignant quote on this, stating, Monsters are tragic beings. They are born too tall, too strong, too heavy. They are not evil by choice. That is their tragedy. Over the decades, Godzilla's villainy would wax and wane through different incarnations, but one of the most important incarnations came recently in the film Shin Godzilla. This movie, in many respects, returns Godzilla to his roots as a personification of wartime destruction. It's probably the most nightmarish version of Godzilla seen on screen thus far, a borderline eldritch being that only brings devastation. But hidden within the narrative is a highly sympathetic portrait of an animal in a state of suffering. Godzilla begins the film in apparent agony, a mutant newly created from nuclear waste barely able to stand. And no matter how destructive he becomes, there's always a sense this is a creature in terrible pain. During the final rampage, ominous operatic music plays, but if you listen to the lyrics, it seems to be a plea from Godzilla's perspective, lamenting that no one understands its sorrow. If I die in this world, who will know something of me? A downward slope is all I see. Shin Godzilla isn't about to save the world with a majestic dropkick, yet the film argues this veritable god of ruin deserves your sympathy as well. Like Mary Shelley's monster, he is a victim of humanity's hubris, a monster who never asked to be made. Conversely, a heroic modern interpretation of the character comes from the legendary films, wherein Godzilla is not a mutant, but a pre-existing superorganism from the Permian period that nuclear testing happened to awaken. This changes the character into more of a force of nature rather than a man-made calamity. Much like the latest version of Kong, Godzilla is presented as a guardian of ecological stability. In fact, those two incarnations of the characters share continuity. A curious byproduct of this reimagining, however, is that like earlier films that framed Godzilla as the protagonist, these monsters now have monsters of their own, unsympathetic living obstacles that must be put down to protect a greater good. Typically, these villains take the form of outside threats to the ecosystem, most traditionally, aliens. Aliens rose to prominence in Hollywood in the late 50s and early 60s, stealing the crown from nuclear mutants as the dominant pop culture monsters. So the fact that the earliest Godzilla films to frame him as a hero put him up against aliens is appropriate turning him into the reigning champion of monsterhood defending the throne from new upstarts. In the US especially, the alien craze reflected Cold War fears of invasion. The extraterrestrials portrayed as infiltrators with secretly deviant appearances and agendas. Aliens might not seem like they belong to the monster category, but though cloaked in the scientific jargon of the space age, most mid-20th century extraterrestrials were still archetypal boogeymen manifestations of cultural paranoia that needed to be vanquished. Not all aliens to come out of this era were malicious, but aliens that could be trusted usually looked like Spock, where anything non-humanoid was more likely to be duplicitous. This is a trend that's continued pretty much until the modern day. There's E.T., of course, but he's something of an outlier. Notable recent works that break from this framing include District 9 and Arrival. The design of the aliens in these films fall in line with the bug or squid-like aliens that terrorized the B-movie of the 1950s and 60s. 
Yet neither of these non-human aliens are depicted as villainous. In fact, the central conflict of both films stems not from the aliens possessing secret plans to invade, but from humanity's fearful reaction to a perceived threat. As was often true in the McCarthy era, the only monsters in these films are the ones people invent, and the ones they become in the name of destroying the imagined interlopers. A sympathetic monster who exists at the crossroads of all these themes is the Gill Man from Universal's The Creature from the Black Lagoon. First appearing in the 50s, the Gill Man was a monster dislodged from time, both in the narrative and in the era the film was released. Though marketed as a sci-fi creation, the Gill Man fit more with the then out-of-style geographic monster of King Kong's era. And as was the case with Kong, the portrayal of the Gill Man is a complicated one. He is easily the least aggressive of the classic Universal monsters, beginning the film as more curious and only resorting to violence after being attacked multiple times, and in his own home no less. As film director Guillermo del Toro puts it, he gets his home invaded and then roughed around, you know? He was at home swimming and these guys barge in. Yet the film itself doesn't fully break from the imperialist model of monsterhood, with the defeat of the Gill Man framed as largely triumphant. This questionable framing is the reason why Del Toro chose the Gill Man as the inspiration for the creature in The Shape of Water. Set in Baltimore in the 1960s, the film subverts the classical monster narrative by making the Fish Man basically the secondary protagonist using his plight as a means of exploring the systemic inequality endemic to the era. The shape of water makes overt what's been true for monster media since its inception, that portrayals of monsters often mirror portrayals of marginalized groups. Leading out of the late 60s, pop culture monsters would become increasingly decentralized as film genres became more diverse, with their appearance and level of sympathy varying greatly. One of the last widespread trends was the horde of zombie-centric media that shambled to the forefront of monsterdom in the 2010s. Though the mindless zombie might feel purely unsympathetic, the myth intertwines with an older, particularly tragic form of monsterhood we'll call the transformed monster. Stories like The Wolfman and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde helped establish the trope of otherwise innocent humans who transform into monsters and lose control. In their monster forms, these characters typically cannot be reasoned with. The sympathy comes from the audience knowing who they were, and recognizing that this is a fate they would never choose. Mainstream zombies appeal to emotion in a similar way. Though the aggressive creatures have lost their humanity, there's no escaping the fact that each one used to be human. Every zombie is the ending of a melancholy tale, a fact that makes it difficult to completely close your heart to them even if they're just enemies in a video game. Speaking of which, the most recent and perhaps largest wave of sympathetic monsters can be found in the medium of video games. Traditionally, most games have stuck to the mythic model of monsterhood, portraying them as unfeeling enemies that the player must overcome. It's a format that makes sense for interactivity. Games are all about obstacles, enemies make for engaging obstacles, and monsters are a clear visual shorthand for enemies. And yet I think a lot of players can point to at least one example of feeling bad for a virtual monster. The first time I encountered this feeling was when I was playing Super Mario Galaxy as a child. Early on in this bright and colorful adventure, you land on an egg of a giant monster that hatches and turns aggressive. You then have to defeat this newborn life form in order to progress. And it wasn't until my first time beating this boss that I realized how sad it is. All this creature knows is violence. It's literally the first stimulus they ever experience. I remember thinking that my actions created this monster. I would just pulled a Frankenstein. Obviously, that's not what the developers intended for young me to take away from this game. In general, you aren't supposed to see video game monsters as thinking, feeling beings. Which is why when a developer intentionally subverts this trope, it can be so powerful. The Dark Souls franchise is filled with tragic enemies, with almost everyone under some form of heart-wrenching curse or another. But easily the most affecting is Sif, a giant wolf who wields a sword. But while this monster might seem ridiculous, 
the loyal canine is only trying to protect the grave of its deceased owner. And to make matters worse, there's an alternate route you can take where you bond with Sif beforehand, and the wolf recognizes you before you do battle. It creates an encounter that makes you reevaluate your role in the story, and wish you could choose to break from the cycle of monster slaying. In the game Skyrim, you actually can choose to break from this cycle. In this game, you play as a predestined hero tasked with defeating a group of villainous dragons, and you are rewarded mechanically for slaying these creatures with useful upgrades. For most of the game's main story, this conflict is pretty clear-cut, with the dragons following the classical, Tolkien-style model of unambiguous evil. But this simplicity is upended when you meet Parthrenax, an elderly dragon who has reached enlightenment through meditation and now avoids conflict. Part of what makes Parthrenax so interesting is he almost seems aware of his metatextual role in the story. He basically knows it's his narrative destiny to be monstrous, and yet he still refuses. What is better, to be born good, or to overcome your evil nature through great effort? And what's heartbreaking is that you're nevertheless tasked with slaying this peaceful being. And if you succeed, the game rewards you with greater power. But you can choose never to initiate this fight, and if what I've read online is any indication, most players don't. Like Parthrenax, people seem able to step out of the narrative and trust empathy over fear. Fear is central to the player's experience in Shadow of the Colossus, the final game I want to discuss in this video. The game puts you up against some of the largest monsters in the medium, creatures so worryingly gigantic that all your panicked mind can think of is how to survive. While you might fear them, they certainly don't seem to fear you. But everything changes when you make it to the 11th Colossus. Not only is this creature relatively tiny compared to the other behemoths, it's scared of you. Most video game enemies don't show fear, it's an emotion that's a little too genuine, a little too human. You defeat the 11th Colossus by wielding a flaming torch to back it off the edge of a cliff. It's a moment that, quite intentionally, makes you question your heroic identity. Because though it's a cliché to say, from this creature's perspective, the monster is you. Humans and monsters have been inexorably intertwined since our beginning. In fact, you could argue humans used to live in a world of monsters. There used to be significantly more megafaunal species that posed a threat to our ancestors. It's easy to imagine that life in such a world would be one of constant fear. But that's not what you see in ancient art of these life forms. You see an incredible amount of care and reverence for each creature, even ones they'd probably had violent encounters with. Though impossible to know the authorial intent behind prehistoric paintings, when I look at these portraits, I feel like the artists were aware that these creatures were alive like they were. I feel like they sympathized with them. The main reason why I pitied dragons when I was little is because they seemed like animals minding their own business until someone invaded their habitat. Indeed, many dragon myths likely stem from interactions with then unfamiliar and dangerous animals. But to my child self, these creatures didn't appear threatening, just misunderstood. I felt that if someone took the time to document their behavior, their fate could have been avoided. In a strange way, I think that's part of what set me on the road towards eventually making this channel. You can't escape monsters. They are culture and history, foundational to how humans define the personhood of themselves and others. Though it's easy to frame sympathy towards them as a linear increase, the truth is monsters are always changing, always representing a new fear or a new avenue for understanding. This is actually my 100th Curious Archive video, and almost every one has featured fictional creatures to some extent. Monsters aren't ever going away, but we can seek to understand them. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.